right. Uh, we're back. We are back. Sule. After a very, very long hiatus. Long hi- hiatus. Sule Heitner, I have here with me. Back to the Focus Podcast. Number 31. Yeah. Apparently, I was number one. You are number one, my friend. I uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were episode you were episode number one apparently and episode number I want to say 15 we'll have to look in the archives 15 or 16 but you were the first one to do the all voice one okay you were the first one to do the online split screen one right we did that during um, COVID COVIDian times the COVIDian, COVIDian times the COVIDian times and then, well, you're the second to do the in... No, sorry, the third to do the in-person one because uh, I did with Dr. Keys and my dad. Cool. So welcome. Welcome back, Sule. Good to be here. <sighs> I have a little kavit. goes well. <sighs> I have a little kavit. Um, I'm, I'm going on three and a half hours of sleep. So... Cheers to that. So um, if I say stupid shit... Just bear with me. We got it on tape. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll try not to say too much stupid shit. Yeah, welcome back to the dot, my friend. Uh, it's good to be here. Yeah. It's good to be here. It was uh, an interesting ride in, but I'm gonna have a much more comfortable ride home. So yeah, it's for the the folks out there that don't know, uh, Sule's from Montreal, and he just came in today and it is quite a drive it's five and a half hours it's six seven sometimes if you're you know doing traffic it responsibly was good. and and traffic but i wasn't make, driving you can make it quickly too it's been done in four maybe that's insane four four is insane four and a half is doable. we did it pretty fast though the dude was was booking it but as as no i can't say that <laughs> you know, as we say in the business, we're not going to say the song calm. Or just right, right, right. Keep this on I'm, the... I'm, I'm holding my tongue because I'm, I'm, I am definitely like prone to saying stupid shit. <laughs> That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for to say shit. And uh, yeah, so anybody <coughs> wondering, I have a red shirt on, which is the Druthers shirt, which is a uh, an independent news outlet in Toronto and uh, their, I don't know, you can call them what you want, labels, whatever, Yeah. but um, they do newspapers and they've been doing newspapers for a long time and basically they're like an alternative news and uh, I think there's been one of those outlets that have been labeled with along with the truckers, you know? Uh, there's both, there's two sides to every story, I think, everything, but as long as I can, <coughs> I think the most important thing is to let all the stories out. And when you're controlling media, there's definitely, uh, in my opinion, like some sort of agenda behind it. If you're just like only allowing certain narratives to, to speak the narrative, then I think I question definitely. Like, and we can kind of go off on this a bit, but. I was asked last year to kind of be like an artist representative, representative for like the trucker movement and stuff like that and the freedom fight and stuff like that. And that's kind of like 100% yeah. what my backing is. But I, ne- I didn't want to be like a, an, a political artist, even though like <laughs> people well, who, who know me, it's like you are a political artist. You like, are, but I got because I, I, I feel a certain way about when whenever the we have these kind of groups, and uh, I think you might feel a little similar. I'm a little bit like <laughs> suspicious about groupthink. It doesn't groups matter. Are the not group. great. Groups aren't the best because no, they're not, and, and, it does, and it doesn't matter what what group it is. Sorry, I'm just getting yeah. There we go. Technical. It doesn't matter what group it is. Like I'm not going to to uh, put the group that I agree with above the group I disagree with. Yeah. All group think to me is a little bit like, eh. Mom-ish. I kind of shy away Mom-ish. with it. Yeah, I don't, I don't Mom-ish. like it. Yeah. I don't like it. I like to be able to think for myself and use critical thinking. Yeah. And to be able to do that, f- 
flexibly like, with, without having to like you know like conform to something to be part of a group. So I get very kind of antsy around groups right away. I do have like opinions that might align with certain groups, but and I think so do you, and yeah. including with the trucker movement, you have ideas that do align with the trucker movement. But do you want to be like really kind of conform? To, it's another group to conform to. I don't want to be like the trucker artist. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, we <laughs> yeah. got, we got, we got. You know, you got popular because you did this song that relates to it. And but on the other hand, I can't say shit because it was a little hypocritical of me to be saying something like that because. The, my biggest, most popular song was like my first song, Piece of Paradise, and basically it was like catapulted off the G20, right? So it's like, I get it, and but I've also seen it, and I've seen the, uh, the other end of it, you yeah. know what I mean? So that's why I'm very reluctant to kind of like be a spokesperson for it, where it's like, I'm trying to show you that it's all manipulation on both sides. Where it's exactly. Where like you're being used in a way... To divide, no matter what. Exactly. Who's right on what side and whatever. But it's like, I saw that blueprint with the G20 and I'm like, this is the exact same blueprint that's being spelled out right now. So it's like, you're given a choice. Aware. It's this or it's that. Be aware. Just yeah. be aware that like this is a trap. And I, I do remember specifically having posts around this time being like, if you're going to go down there, just be aware of like, you know, something that's going to go off with the police and they're going to blame the protesters for it. And they're going to use that as a justification to, to like gloss the whole thing over with this one incident. Right. Yeah. And it happened like they went out and they had the, the, the cops on horses and stomped people on the heads. But it's like this was. Well, your head shouldn't be near the horse's hooves exactly. in the first place. But it's like <laughs> they're Jokes. luring you down there to <clears throat> to get revved up, to <clears throat> be in to 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 get into that mode, to justify what they're you know doing. But this case, which was different, I think, than the G twenty, is this caught national news, and now mm -hmm. it's very important. I think. 100% important for Canadians to understand other perspectives from around the world and how we're being viewed in this situation. You know what I mean? It's like, it's easy for us to say a lot of stuff because we have a lot of privileges, you'd say, in Canada in a certain way and then not as much as the U.S. in a certain way because I was in New York and Manhattan where you would think, you know, this is like, one way of thinking they agree with stuff like this but they are 100% with the truckers and it's yeah, like I know. they do not like Trudeau or our, gov our government and well, they, like nobody likes anyone's government nobody no one likes their own yeah and I mean like politically in this country I've been hearing very very po polarized you know like you and I are kind of a, not we don't think the same way but we're kind of in the in the in our ways, sort of central and, and critical thinkers. Yeah. And it's like you know, I I hear our one group think that is saying Trudeau is like the antichrist. Yeah. He's the worst thing that's ever happened. We're all going to hell in a handbasket. Canada is done. It's finished. Uh, like the doomsayer. And I know that the that element, the doomsayer, is all over. Can I just interject with that quickly? Sorry. It's yeah. Like that being said, how many of that of those people that are like that are religious? Okay, just that's just, just throwing that throwing out there. there. Throwing but that out. Whatever the answer to that yeah. may be, there's a whole other group who are like, he is the second coming. Yes. He's amazing. Look yeah. what he's done. Look at all the amazing things he's done. Yeah. And I'm thinking as a critical thinker, I'm like, he's really not that bad. Canada's still here. We're still existing. We're not in any danger of this is not an existential problem He's not, but he hasn't done a lot of stuff that I like there's a lot of things I would criticize yes. him on and it's like can we be like adults and stop freaking out like our hair's on fire like you know no that's not possible <laughs> come on Chile you're asking him way too much it's like ah my hair's on fire okay so we went there right away which was which is kind of cool so we'll probably circle back to that I guarantee of course. So let's just 
Um, let's just talk about like where we left off. Like we were in the lockdown. You and I started dabbling a lot with, um, you know, uh, Instagram split screen conversations. Yeah. We'd have our, our, you know, our podcasts. I was doing online, and. <laughs> I went back to school and almost didn't yeah, talk about we're that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a second, but it's like, um, how do you feel now? Now we're like 2024. It's like, are we, uh, are we taking a lot of good things from the lockdown and bring it like to a new level as independent artists? Or are we like, did it take us down a notch? Like being isolated. Okay, let's talk about that. Cause yeah. I, <laughs> ask me that question. So, it's like, do we have better tools now as indie artists or is it harder? You know what I mean? Uh, you know what? Someone asked me last night at the, the show I was playing how, how business was. Yeah. And uh, I was just like, well, it's, I, I described it like this. It's like, yeah, we're back from the pandemic, but it came back in a weird way. Mm-hmm. Like, it didn't come back in a way that I feel confident. I feel like um, the, in, the institutions of our industry, the publishers and, and record companies and all of those type of festivals, everything, um, they don't, do not want to take a risk. They uh, want to stick with the artists that they signed before the pandemic and during and after they were like kind of like ah let's not sign anyone else let's just deal with what we have maybe even like get rid of a few if we can too, too safe too safe uh, i and i mean like the industry is no longer being run by by uh by creatives it's being run by bean counters by mbas and by people who are like just really thinking about the bottom line um i think that sometimes there's a trade off like if you think only about the bottom line and not about the product. I mean, to me, the product that you give, that you put out, is a part of that bottom line. But to a lot of these people, it's only about what's coming in, the revenue, the profits. It's never about what they're putting out. In fact, if they can put out less to get more back, that's the game. That's the bean counter game. Mm -hmm. Whereas to the artist, it's like, if I can give something of value, I want the full value of what I'm giving. But so I'm going to create something of high value to get, you know, like, whereas the bean counter wants to create something of low value and get high value back. So that being said, and here's our wine shot. Yeah, this is who's running our business this now. This is uh, brought to you by uh, Bordeaux Wine. If you want to be a sponsor, we're, we're, we're here. <laughs> we'll, we'll be there for you. Uh, we support the French in every wine way. Wine and cheese way. This is a great. This would be a great sound bite. That just like this. And we drink it out of coffee cups, like real Europeans, not like you Nancy North Americans with your glasses and stuff. Uh, this is how it's done properly. I thought we were just hiding at like talk show hosts. We were, uh, actually, this is water. We're drinking good H two O. Um, no, I, I, like, this just kind of, like, I'm kind of really being selfish with this question in a way because it's, like, my frustration of actually trying to book in some festivals, and I do, you know me, I do all my own booking and everything as yourself, and you see the back end of it, and I see this exact same back end where it's, like, you know... It's about cuts. I'm a unique artist, you're a, a unique artist... And it's like they know what works, and they're just gonna stick to that. And and uh, I find it's just like the well, same. Well, no, I gotta push back on that a bit, a little bit, just because they know what they think works. Yes, sorry, I'll and, take that back. I'll and that they back. Yeah. they don't really know what works because you're oftentimes right, you're right, you're right. what what has been working stops working because yes. you got you you have to have a renewal. You have to have. This I'll is take important. that back. I'll take that back. Okay. So, no, so the, other, just that that's no, my only exactly. pushback was they that yeah. don't know they're going off what they think they know which right. is success from the past yeah past or, success which is not, not a not good success but like satisfactory you know what I mean like we covered our cost and all this stuff people are happy there's no complaints 
There was nobody bitching about music. But they don't know the levers of how much to change things so that the audience exactly. always feels refreshed, but also is familiar with But it. the audience, what they don't realize is wanting a lot more. Wanting a whole lot of different types of music. And you and I were already on this mm -hmm. train, you know, going to s smaller places, Ontario and Quebec, and our dynamic is pretty unique. You know, and people are seeing this and they're pretty satisfied with the different styles. Let's explain to, to, to people in case they're just tuning in, they don't know our dynamic. Yeah, you give a little rundown. Alex is a, a very um, interesting hip hop artist. He's doing uh, a lot of lyrical stuff. I would, I would say there's it's political, but it's not only just political, it's spiritual. It's, it's, it's um, conscious, conscious hip hop. Um, the musical arrangements are interesting, kind of the jazz and uh, very uh, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of a lot of influences there. And meanwhile, I'm doing something completely different. I'm doing um, a sort of renaissance of uh, African American folk music, which is like involving the banjo and a lot of songwriting and a lot of research actually that's going back into like uh, various periods, but not to be a traditionalist, really actually to in a sense, have one foot in that past and one foot in the present and future. So you can bring things, you know, along as, as, as it goes. But that's two different contexts. Yet somehow they work very well together where you play the shows live. The same audiences watches both, both parts of that show. And, you know, they come away with an experience. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's kind of cool because it's like, okay, I wasn't expecting that. And that's the beauty, honestly, in my opinion, of like what defined Canadian artists as Canadian artists. The cool thing about Canadian artists is that they were all uniquely their own. And if you look at all the different artists throughout the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s that were Canadian that stood out, they were not only like, okay, you couldn't even know until you found out they were Canadian, but they were all s distinctly unique. Okay, name, yeah. name me uh, one or two right now. Celine Dion, like cool. there's nobody like her. Right. Brian Adams, there's nobody like him. Okay, my turn. Bruce yeah. Coburn. Nobody like him. Oh man, he's, he's, he's one of my favorite You know favorite what I mean? Guitars. Like there's, that's my point, right? Is like, and you and I are kind of like that throwback and it's also like... And what's his name? The, 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 the little big band. Um, uh, guitar player, blues guitar player. Um, they, now I'm thinking of another blues player, but we got a lot of good good Canadian musicians. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. But Jeff Healy. Jeff, Jeff Healy. Healy. But everybody that was from Canada is, is the unique style artist, right? Yeah. And now we've lost a lot of that. And now I think it's coming back and like... Yourself and myself, we are going around to these towns and people are getting different perspectives of music they've already heard for a long time. So, like, they've heard hip hop, but they're not seeing, they're not hearing it from somebody that looks it's like there. They, they've yeah. heard your like music, but they're not, they've never s seen it presented from somebody like your that looks exactly like yourself, right. So, it's like now they're they're getting this like soundtrack, but they're seeing it in a different artists you know what I mean like yeah so but the, the comparison you had before of of having like music like this from the past like things that were unique and so on and things becoming more generic I think there's always been this kind of unique thing it's just that the generic has kind of become the cookie norm cutter. Cookie the cookie cutter, cutter. it's yeah. become the mainstream and the the, the 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 what we expect and so what was once the mainstream was this unique kind of like Let's and it's people like, who were running, I was like, let's stick it, there, throw it up against the wall, see if it sticks. Yeah. And now it's like this well, very that's the like, problem with what we're getting the, the back end out with Canadian music because it's not necessarily that the, the artists aren't there. Yeah, like, the unique artists are there. They're everywhere. It's just that we're not being seen or exposed. Everybody to the who has the radio stations, like it. If you look at all the radio stations in Canada, they're only run by a few companies: Rogers, Chorus, Bell, you know, Bell, three companies. So they're all. They have the same mandate. They have the same like. Uh, I think Quebec Corps might have a few too. They have the same yeah. format. They have the same. They're gonna take the same uh, songs and play them in the same format. You know what I mean? So for an indie artist, there's not a lot of option 
stations. You have college radio. You have a couple of satellite radios. But in Canada... And you're just talking to radio. There's this, just talking like, radio. Expand this to every other element of the industry exactly. outside radio, and it's the same thing. So There's just limited places to promote your stuff and to be heard and seen. So, the, and then that's where we circle around to the festivals as well. They're just going with that same mentality as well. It's like The you, gatekeepers. Like, gonna, who gets in and who gets out? We're going to keep the same folk singer. We're going to keep the same safe rock band. We're going to keep the same, like, you know, like, image of somebody that's safe for family. But it's like, they really don't know what people like because uh, they don't realize how much old people love fucking hip-hop music. And, like, something that they think is going to make somebody uncomfortable is actually more uh, refreshing to somebody because they're seeing something that's pushing the envelope. It's just such you know a I mean? huge like aversion to any again, risk. Like, any risk is there's yeah. a huge aversion. It's like you see, uh, you see some hip-hop. You see some, some, some experimental jazz, but it's kind of cool and funky. You see some, some stuff happening that's, like, it's, it's just off the beaten track. Yeah. enough to be like refreshing yeah. but it's enough on the track to be accessible to people yeah and yet just because it's off the beaten track even a little bit that aversion to risk totally wipes it off so the table because you you know we've done a lot of solo shows together but we've also done <coughs> more solo shows on our own let me ask you this like i thought for me especially i get way more response from like the senior crowd because it's so different and they're like six years old plus and they're so authentically happy and surprised by what they hearing from you and they're like oh my goodness thank you for saying that or doing or having the balls to say that or, or like you know being that type of artist that's speaking out because it's reminding them of their rebellious times, you know what I mean? Like almost the hippie flower child, you know, generation. And that, yeah, let's the, be the honest. Folk generation. We never lose that. that. That little bit of teenage angst just still yeah. lives with us even to into our middle age. Like yeah. we still have a little bit like uh, of the, you know, piss and vinegar from our, yeah. <laughs> from our youth, you know? Mm. So absolutely, I can see that. But in my experience, it's that crowd, 100%. And I feel there's a, that gap where there's a, a people in the middle who are not really relating. And then it's younger crowd. Yeah. Like kids. The kids really like The it. kids and the, and the, the older adults. The, my, my ultimate crowd, and I have a theory as to why, but I'll tell you what the ultimate crowd is, would be a whole bunch of grandparents with their grandchildren. Yeah. And I would, I would get them all. Like they'd all be dancing. We'd all be singing exactly. along. Exactly. Me you know? too. <laughs> I agree a hundred percent. My but like, yeah. I, my theory as to why this is the case. Okay, let's. Um, let's. I think that first of all, uh, and this is not going in an order of any kind of criteria, like a, what importance or anything like that. It's just the first thing that comes to my head is that we have not educated people for cultural, how, culturally. Period. No. We have not educated people culturally. Period. So, how to applaud, how to appreciate, how to go to a museum, how to be a person of, like who is able to consume culture in um, the etiquette of consuming yeah. culture, anything like that. I'll intervene. People too. don't know. The way to really like uh, show your appreciation for the value of art. Right. Even knowing that it has a value. Like, it's gotten like that. So, number two, I mean, we've talked about the, you and I, about the dumbing down of people. And it's like, yeah, it's like, just to be able to get to that place, to be able to access it, to be able to appreciate art mm. for what it is, it takes a certain level of, of um, education. And I mean, it's a privilege, education. And not everyone has access to that education. But in this country, as I'm learning. <laughs> I'm going to call you Mr. Segway because this is the ultimate segue. We have access we to have education. Access to segue <laughs> we don't have access to healthcare, but we do have access to education. And I can tell you that as a person, I, I'm living proof of it. You are uh, an <laughs> educator. And let's, uh, you know, I think 
We'll have to go back to the archives with the the first online podcast I had with you. And I believe you were really just starting to delve into the history of the banjo. So yeah. we're going to talk about education, and you got your sweater up to show the folks. Oh, yes. This is like, you showed off your sweater. I show off mine. This is um, McGill. McGill University. I'm doing a, a, I'm a, a, a doctorate candidate. So let's... let's in musicology, the whole, let's do the whole enchilada because uh, most most of the good folks that watch us know you're a banjoist. Is that a word? A banjoist. Ban- yeah, that's a, that's a word. You're a banjoist. Banjo player. We banjoist. Got a banjo, we got a, a, a professional banjoist, and uh, I guess yeah, I am. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think maybe you were just getting into it. You were just starting to learn how to make your own banjo. Yeah, um, I was getting into the history right about that. We did that episode, so get everybody up into speed on that. So your your one of your primary instruments you play is a banjo, and now you've gone down this crazy Alice crazy in Wonderland hole. Rabbit hole! Oh my gosh! Yeah, you went down the giant rabbit <laughs> hole of of banjo, and now look. So so give us a, a little explanation of all that, and then. Tell us about your education with McGill and that. And then, which is kind of what we just finished off, is like the more education the fans get, they'll demand this better other type of stuff. Exactly. And it's, uh, anyways. So, yes, we left off. Um, we I, I know I've spoken about the banjo, and I've been really like kind of... Uh, it, it has kind of captivated my 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 attention and my passion, and uh, so I it's went back to school. It's become like your identity as your artistry, as like your. It is, you know, and way, it's like it's kind of funny because it encapsulates it, encapsulates it. You know, right before this time, I was playing it for like nine years before yeah. this, and he, and before that, it was kind of like poking at me. Like people were like, yeah. uh, "Can you play the banjo on this song?" And I was like, "I don't know how to play banjo." It's just do whatever you're musical and you can figure something out and so and that's sorry, what that's it did that's always a pre- personal favorite of mine is the uh, wish you were here oh yeah yeah banjo. so that was yeah that's wish always, you were here that's when, fun when we do shows together that's always like a personal favorite of mine when we do that anyways uh, yeah. thank you yeah so yes I I uh, from learning to build a banjo and to working on that research I, I went back to school in musicology I have uh, I'm right now writing my thesis in um, in in the for for my masters and it's like it's to like kind of admit because you know well it has a lot of uh, ties to it right where it's like so the, the thing that that I remember specifically when you, we were started talking about this subject it was like the thing the thing that you were really it dawned on you was like and it even hit you you were like okay our whole lives this idea of the banjo has been like a hillbilly type of instrument like a dumbing yeah. down type of instrument of just like just like uh like an organ grinder type of thing you know it's like ah oh, i just got the sideshow but now you, and but with you, the hillbilly with it like it, it was a kind of like a denigration of the banjo yes and the person from the mountain south yes the mountaineer so it was also who's who's Deemed a hillbilly. I mean, like this is so, a term that beto- between p- people from the region, it's fine. But outsiders, it's a little bit derogatory. So, like, you know. So, so that's <laughs> what really fast. When when you started getting into this, that's what really hit me with the fascination of it. It was like, oh yeah, man. You think about it. You don't even really realize it, but it's like, yeah, it's been very stereotyped. That type of instrument. Yeah. And you're like. Shit, yeah, all I do think about is like <clears throat> fucking Steve Martin in that one movie. 
And all I think about is like uh, deliverance or something. I think it is. Okay, I have an experiment <laughs> also, to do with it. But you. also, like, I think that that is just like some hee haw instrument. Hee haw, right? it, exactly. Yeah. And it is. It is a hee haw instrument. But it's a lot more than that. And the true story is far more fascinating what than what we've been led to believe. Like, yeah. I was like, there's been a cultural transmission that is actually quite beautiful All right, between so people who the, are quite different. Let's and then, do like, the thing, or, or we'll do the thing, and then you tell us about like that, what you learned about what it actually is. Cool. All right. So you want to do the, so you're going to test me on something, yeah. No, uh, like the, uh, yeah, when, like what I thought. Yeah. When I first started playing the banjo. Like I'm picking up this instrument and I'm I'm loving it. I'm listening to the sound. I'm listening to the way that the strings kind of resonate over the this beautiful skin, you know. And it's captivating my my artistry, of course. But I'm assuming that this is a, a a white instrument. It's from the mountain south. It's from the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, I believe that the whole um, deliverance that that whole narrative. Yeah. We play banjos here, and I was like, yeah, yeah no. That's, down I just went right down to that. And yeah, as far as dumbing down, look at that movie, mm -hmm. Deliverance. And these, these mountain folks are, are sodomites and like, <laughs> as backwards in as they get. Inbred, yeah, yeah. inbred sodomites. Eating with squirrels and you shit. Know, like, yeah. But they can sure play the banjo. Play the banjo. Ain't no talents for that I mean, man. like, how is it? Like, it, it's both, it's, it's denigrating of both the banjo and the people. It's like, yeah. you know? And it's parallel to another denigration because if you look at the denigration of African Americans yes. as an enslaved African, it's a little bit on that parallel. So that aligned exactly what it, what you're talking about of your discovery of it, right? I mean, it, you found out that the origin, well, the transmission really, of that the culture, of the, the actual instrument. I think that's what really opened up. Well, yeah, for me, it was like right? the discovery that it's an African American. Instrument and not African, but African American, specifically from the the Caribbean. So when did the, when did that uh, realization come? I would have been right about like my ninth year playing in the pandemic, and I, that's when I started doing this research. And I think that's about when we did that first podcast, yeah, yeah. or one of the podcasts, yeah. It. And uh, so I did a lot more research. I I went back to school. I'm now finishing a master's in, in musicology and starting a PhD in September. Um, very excited about that. Um, but yeah, the, that study and the research that has gone with it has exposed a kind of cultural transmission that to me I find really beautiful because it's between human beings, uh, human beings that are quite different but still can find commonalities and and it isn't always, that's the thing, we're, we're led to believe that the, the interactions of cultures between like Europeans and Africans or Europeans and indigenous were just always confrontational. Mm -hmm. And they were never um, more inter integrational and, and, uh, and sharing. Like, sharing. Exactly. But in fact, of course there were there were confrontational ones, and of course there were there there was domination and oppression and all that kind of stuff. But there was also this transmission that was far more on the level of like it's two funny. humans just sharing culture and being curious and interested in how the other one does that. It's funny, it's amazing you just said that because now it's something just dawned on me. It's like if you maybe if you dig up a lot of history of like what was confrontational and what was more educational meetings it's almost like it's these um moments of technology that it's more like education sharing where like war is more coming from places of non-education you know what i mean not being, exactly not being familiar with this this like the you know the spanish hence the reason why the i spanish, want to expose and, this, and yeah when the spanish showed up to mexico and they were with Aztecs and cannibalism. It's like, of course you're going to go to war because it's like that you're uneducated on that, and it's foreign. And even the even it's the cannibalism alien that might have to you, and it's alien, totally. You know what I mean? Where it's like the cannibalism might have been a Spanish invention as a propaganda tactic. Who knows? Like you know, like, like the whoop. same way as like the same way as like a flu for the wherever you know. You know, and also like. Um, you look at the pyramids and, and you 
and if you want to go into all these texts and these different explanations of like what were the pyramids for it was like the central point of knowledge and Unaki. Yes. Yeah. 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 And Unaki. And Unaki. And Unaki. And Unaki. And Unaki. I feel like that's a Simpsons song right there. Well. I got it. Where's I gotta, David Icke? No, I, no, no. I got to give a shout out to to a, a YouTube channel that I really like called The Y Files because mm. that's that's where I got that from. And you love that channel, by the way. Giving a shout out, free of charge. And you we're not sponsored. Are say, uh, <laughs> David Icke's not as crazy as he seems to be. But he's a little crazy. He's but crazy he's not all as the way. not but not as crazy. Not as crazy <laughs> as you really think. I'm just saying. Yeah, so that's that's a really interesting like uh, you know epiphany and like kind of realization of like holy shit, and that's like a polarization of just like I was like one instrument that could totally change your perception on a whole bunch of shit because it's just like shit. okay, not only is it not from the Appalachians like in the south of New Orleans, but it's a slave trade instrument. It was it's, literally invented because of the allowing straight slave trade. So what did you find out after that? And you, so you started digging a little more research into that. So you found out like it's not it's not from the Appalachians. It's actually a Caribbean instrument. So that plays a lot more role into the history of it as well, right? And so it's like now you've opened up this giant you know rabbit hole of not just. Uh, an instrument, but it's also like an origin of the styles of music in America and into Canada. Right? Yeah, like it's like it, it's the birth of blues and these other types well, of and music. And ragtime, so like, which is like proto jazz. So if you think about it, it's like it 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 has all the undertones with it. It's like this instrument comes across, you know, from Africa to. To the Caribbean, it comes with the stories. It comes with the yeah. experience. It comes with the actual, you know, day to day lives. So of course, this is how the music is gonna evolve. Like it, it, it was an instrument that came with the scenario. So it's like it birthed basically all these different styles of music, which branched out into all these other styles of American music. Right, and that's what you found out, right? That was like really a huge kind of like uh, under you had a huge understanding, and then, and then you took on this huge like uh, you know job. Like this undertaking, this, out, this huge <laughs> this undertaking. undertaking, and it, that's uh, a funny word, undertaking, because yeah. it really kills you, right? It, it really, kills. it fucking I went puts undertake. you six feet under. Oh, it really seriously. puts you six feet under. Oh right? yes, yeah. But it's fascinating at the same time and very, very kind of, it's, it's like invigorating to, to look into this kind of stuff. Because what I started looking into is that question, why did this instrument become so associated with the Appalachian Mountains and with the European the Caucasian the culture that, of that of area? Uh, history, right? And yeah, and so disassociated from the African American. And I find that a fascinating question because the answers are quite revealing, but they're revealing of m a myriad of kind of cultural forces that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, now, the research into this is incomplete, and I'm still going to keep going into it, but from what I can see at the moment now, it's a bit of you have um, sort of fledgling corporate forces as sort of the catalyst to this kind of trying to build a market for manufactured banjos mm. and you know build that market amongst affluent middle class upper middle class you know people in the United States the mainstream society which is basically a white society you know I'm not going to say 100% but let's say 99 you know so there's a lot of whiteys so out that, there. There's that element as number one. There's a second element of you found um, people who were formerly enslaved, yeah. um, reluctant to sing some of the songs and the you know the folk songs and the spiritual songs that they were accustomed to singing. Mm -hmm. 
the reasons why they had that reluctance and they expressed it was because this was these were sometimes called sorrow songs and they were songs that were kind of they were not kind of they were associated associated with a lot of the suffering and the ordeals that they went so they're not they're, really good feel good songs right no but very authentic very real songs and so demanded by a public a mostly liberal white public that wanted to hear and preserve this heritage and they wanted to hear authentically from people who had sung it and part of me is very understanding of the african american formerly enslaved people who were reluctant to sing this while i'm also grateful to the demand that they not let it so it's a go under and, and be forgotten hence gospel is is remembered and gospel was and this is a little bit how i feel about the banjo it's like Okay, so the banjo might have been another one of these things that were a cultural heritage of African Americans that was associated with enslavement and therefore undesirable. Something to be discarded and to move on from. Yeah. And an understandable instinct, absolutely. But at the same time, it's such a, a, a very strong and deep connection with Africa that it's a shame that we let that go. Well, like the gospel and the spirituals, I, I'm I'm grateful that that demand that we continued that in the culture, and then that culture spread, and that you know gospel is now an international thing. It's beautiful. So. No, it's interesting you say the word culture because it's like that's very convoluted nowadays, right? Where it's like, and especially with with hip hop and stuff, they're like, oh, the culture, the culture, but the culture was has been like sabotaged, and it's like. Mainly, I think, in my point of view, because you're not aware of the culture, of the exact real culture, and that's where the, the banjo has a major port, like a major uh, influence on that, because that's it's like the, the first or, instance of that origin. Happening. So if you it's say, where it started, yeah, like. if you if the, if people were really aware of that origin and that story, that would clear up a lot of shit down the road, because it's like yeah. that's where it started, and now yeah. like. You know. People point to hip hop and say, "Okay, but this happened before with rock and roll." Yeah, and they think that's where it happened. Oh yeah. no, no, it happened you know, earlier. Happened blues. with jazz, no, and blues. Go back before that. Go back all to the, the banjo. Way, all the way to the banjo. Go back to before emancipation, basically, yeah. when the music created by the enslaved was a commodity. It was a value. It was something that was owned by the master. Just like everything else that the, the enslaved person could create of value or do, uh, any service, like harvesting crops, yeah. writing songs you, or making music would have also been something of value. What you said was interesting is, is like, I've never heard it from that perspective as well. It's like you're torn half between it, you know what I mean? Like half of you was like, okay, this is the, this is the oppression here, but at the same time it needs to be told. It needs but to be told, you're, you're, and it's also the way that our ancestors used to survive that pr oppression. Yeah, but and you're it's split. an effort to honor that that you're survival. Split, but you're split on it by by like performing because yeah. you're like, well, you know. You understand the reluctance to continue an art form that is associated with this time, yes. this difficult time. Yeah, it brings up and conjures up a lot of trauma. But at the same time, it is what your ancestors have used to survive that trauma. Exactly. And to forget it would be to dishonor them. Almost so, like... <laughs> well, and, and also this, this, this art form that was created out of trauma is a really beautiful art form that should be shared with the rest of the human so let me, family. Let me say this from a viewer's perspective. Is that you, what, everything you just said exactly there, you are presenting it in a beautiful way. So, and you are, what you're doing is you're filtering all of that thought. If it's a black audience, if it's a white audience, if it's all that. <laughs> My supervisor you, thinks I'm trying to do too much. No, he but might be right. No, you are. He's 100% right. He's a fucking thousand. You know what? Let's give a shout out to your supervisor. Yes, David Brackett. You're yes. right. And he's taking on way too fucking much. But... At the same time, dude, you're doing a lot of like, like, uh, you know, 
your catalyst. Yeah. You're like, you're really doing... And I'm going to I'm going to whittle this stuff down. I'm gonna, over time, yeah. I'm going to get to the rest of the stuff. So what, whatever, my, point so. is, my point was, is that is you are like filtering down, not filtering it, because that sounds like censorship. It's synthesizing it. Sounds it, like of. censorship, but you're like, you're taking all this, because all this information, you're editing it down. That yeah. Edited is a better word. You're editing it down into like a simple format of a song that people can translate it into their own ideas and you're giving that warm feeling to people of like okay this is like more than just like uh, we should feel ownership of our music that than, we created here in the Americas yes but it's more it's more you're giving people more of like a, a self-satisfaction of just like oh this is a a uh, hillbilly instrument that's kind of like uh, a joke. No, you know it's I mean? our instrument. You're giving all it of ours. Art, you're giving it art and you're giving it beauty where people are like really appreciating it for the instrument that it is. Yeah. As opposed to like, you know, like a gesture type of thing. It's like I got bells and whistles on and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, so no, it's. Kudos to you, man, for that shit. And, and it's like, you know. You were taking something that's been around for a long time and you're flipping the shit on how people, you know, see it and perceive it and take it in and ingest it. I got to give a few shout outs because I am so not alone in this the white effort. Yeah. I mean, I am amongst a community of, of people. So I discovered when I first discovered this, I discovered this through uh, Rihanna and Giddens. Uh, she was doing an interview on NPR with... Um, Who's that again, sorry? Rhiannon Giddens is a banjo player and a singer, fantastic artist. Okay, yeah. yeah. She uh, was part of the, the Carolina Chocolate Drops, but right now she's probably most notably known as the, the banjo player for Beyonce on her song. Uh, oh, the yeah. Sing Texas. Yeah. That's Rhiannon playing. And amazing artist. So I learned this whole history. It started with an interview with her. And um, and um, I'm on for um, is it what's her, her first name again? I'm on Poor and Friends. This is the show. It's on NPR. Oh yeah, I yeah. So I was watching yeah yeah. I was watching that and I first got kind of wind of this and I started looking into it more and more. And she had said something that really resonated. She had said like when I first heard about the fact that. Like I'm sitting there learning square dancing in school because it's mandated. It's mandated. It's like we every Where kid is has she fun. from? Like Texas or South? North Carolina. Yeah. So of course. Or South. It's all the Car one of the Carolinas. It's it's embedded. Yeah. yeah. So she's learning to square dance, and she's 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 a a person of um of a mixed um I hate saying mixed race because it's not really mixed race. Mixed ethnicity is more more accurate. So. She didn't think that square dancing had anything to do with her, and she's learning that that the calls, that like uh, swing your partner around, around, dose do, and all this kind of stuff. This is really coming from the black community. Mm -hmm. So the calls, like the the actual dances, this is you know influences of Franco Americans square dancing. If you listen to it, it's all like Allemand. They don't say Deutsch. It's Allemand. So they're speaking so that's French. New Orleans based, right? That's like a lot of New Orleans. Well, history. Louisiana, which was basically the yeah. entire interior of the United yeah. States at one point. So yeah, that whole area was was French, and they had like the do si do, which is do a do. You know, like mm -hmm. all of the calls are are basically kind of French, but the uh, the people are translating. Are, the reason why they call it out is because people, you know, it was it was a. A tradition inside the black community, like yeah. these kind of call and response kind of thing, is is a, Which is is a very black to thing. In a lot. Very much, you see, like, and the, the whole like working things out. And Bro, you just blew my fucking mind. I didn't realize that at all. The call it is. out shit is yeah. all from the square dance shit. When, well, actually, the square dance shit call out and the hip hop shit call out are from the same parent thing, which is just Whoa. the African like. It's like tap dancing. It's like everyone has their version of it, but it's yeah, all coming but from the never same. Fucking it is. Of it like that. That's what blows. That's why I find Whoa. this research so fascinating. 
That's why I get so fascinated with this stuff. Cause okay, so I broke. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but. So yeah, yeah, the calling out and stuff is part of the that African, uh, even though it's like it's French and it's African, and there's, but there's indigenous influence, there's there's British influence. However, you get like a guy like, um, was it, Ford, yeah, Henry Ford, who is very concerned with trying to promote a certain. He he hated jazz. He thought jazz was um, like going to cause them pothead pothead mentality. Bunch of morally lazy. repugnant lazy it comes down to lazy you know not lazy not productive not productive so jazz assembly was like line a, productive right not assembly line but productive. jazz was like a, a threat to yeah. the america that ford envisioned and what he envisioned as something was like okay i'm going to use my wealth to sponsor fiddle competitions and square dance uh competitions and, and these type of things because this is the real awesome. America. What he's not saying is this is white America. Yeah. But it wasn't. That's the thing. It was like, it was branded as that. It was branded as white, yeah. as white America. Square Dance was branded as white. It was, um, you know, like the fiddling was branded as white, even though fiddling was something that's quite universal amongst everyone. Which, oh, I'm just so happy with this conversation because, you know, now we've come around to the circle, my friend, again which is exactly what we were talking about at the beginning of this episode is like the perception in Canada of music. So I get a lot of flack because being a white rapper, I get, well, we don't do rap here. We don't do this here. We don't do that here. Like every what, rapper do you, <laughs> what do you do here? So the, the, like the, I find Both out, kinds of music. I find out the music that they, they do do. It's like, okay, so you're denying, uh, a style of music that is predominantly done by black culture, but you are also embracing all these other country, blues, jazz. You're only pull, pulling up that type of music, but that was started and in influenced by but black culture. It, but that's not acknowledged. You know until until now, so until people are starting white, to push that acknowledgement. They think it's white music, but it's like, and this is what blows my brain. It's like uh, Beyonce is putting out a country album. She's See, getting flack, but it's like a lot of country music is. I want to applaud Beyonce because it's like Stevie Wonder went through the same thing where he tried to introduce country music, and people were like, "Oh, you can't do that." Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles. Ray Char- I Sorry, mean, I meant I, Ray Charles. That's yeah. right, Ray Charles. I mean, but the thing with Beyonce, I lo- I love the fact that. I'm, I have my issues. I I tried to listen to the entire album from beginning to end. It is it's poppy. A, it's a poppy. lot. It's a, it's a lot of material to get through. Yeah. Honestly, maybe it's also the fact that I'm still in my work for school and I just like have limited time to begin with. But the fact is, is that I couldn't make it through the entire yeah. 31 songs or 39 songs. That's ridiculous. It's like a As lot. For it's a lot. Our listener. It's a lot. However. There was moments of the, the whole album I thought were brilliant. There were moments I thought were like, meh, whatever. But whatever I thought about the material, I got to give her props for reclaiming country for herself because she's a girl from, from Texas. Yeah. She's country as it gets. Yeah. And to, to sit there and just like own it and be, after some of the criticism that she's received for trying to like, you know, what people say pretend to be country and it's like pretend this girl's more country than like Taylor Swift yeah exactly <laughs> like, <laughs> and my, my, and so, but I, I opinion, accept Taylor but Swift's country opinion, and I, like, I have no given no, no misgivings about Taylor Swift being country Every, it's for everyone no one's no one's shut out of but this. I think but, I think the misconception too is <laughs> like what we've really fallen to a major bad trap is like the look of somebody yeah the look of somebody in their outfit that almost determines the genre, and then we'll just put a little something. And let's just say it clearly, the color of skin. And I've had that. Oh yeah, absolutely, as absolutely. In my own 100%. career, I am not Beyonce. I'm no Michael Jackson. I don't have a career that's that big. Yeah. And it has affected my career. Absolutely, and I've seen it going with you around town, uh, uh, like hey, these small towns. I had a musician who kept on wondering if I was gonna be beat up by the KKK in every small town. 
Let's talk about let's talk about this this one thing do you that's do been, you feel do you feel threatened? Do you feel, do you feel in danger? We're gonna, do you feel safe? We're gonna bring up this story. This is hilarious. This is the funniest shit. So there's an artist in uh, Montreal that we're not we're not gonna speak about. He's he's a, a musician. And anyways, so this type fantastic of, guy. This type of mentality of like, you know, um <coughs> uh, People being too safe with people in a way where it's like lack of accountability. Lack of accountability. So he is like this is a person who's had so had no musician. accountability. So he's a musician and he's touring with Sule, and they're going to a lot of you know small Canadian towns and you know and this is exactly what we're talking about. It's like okay, people are not exposed to an artist like Sule a lot or an artist like myself a lot. So they react in certain ways that are not negative. They're positive, just, actually. Po- they're more positive than negative any of the times. Far more like... But yeah. there are a few people that, this is what Sometimes. you're saying, that want to be safe. And that safe, the more safe you are sometimes, the more you get yourself into danger. bad situations, <laughs> into danger. Yeah. So... Where a lot of people were like, eh, our audience is going to be uncomfortable with a white rapper or our audience is going to be uncomfortable with a black country singer. And it's like, no, you're uncomfortable with that. The audience member will love it. Will fucking love it. So I know my job. (laughs) Sule Sule was touring with this one guy and they went into a small town (laughs) and he was concerned that the audience wasn't going to be receptive to you being black and they were going to be like what he didn't know is that I'd already had to deal with that myself yeah. within me with it like yeah. without society yeah just what society had put on me since birth and tell, I already had tell to deal me again with it. what he said exactly is the best, it's just like one of the greatest things I've ever heard oh <laughs> Do I remember even exactly, or have said, I blocked it out? No, okay, <laughs> let me, let me, because you, Cause I think you might remember better. I might better. remember better. So he said to you, so you went in this specific venue, <laughs> and you were like, comfortable, because this is you. Like, you've done this a hundred times. I belong where I You've belong, done this a hundred times. You can pull whatever. up to a stoop anywhere in And I'm stoop. not thinking of anything like this. And Suley, like, I'll no, tell no, you no. this. You can pull up to a stoop anywhere in the country and everybody fucking love you, man. You just pull out that banjo and start playing. Nobody will be feeling And it's out not of place. hard. Like, you just like look at the banjo and it's like, I'll twist he, my rubber nobody arm. Nobody will coming feel out, out of place. So he felt that your blackness was going to make people feel Wait, uncomfortable. My, my very blackness. I'm almost. <laughs> hold on. Look. If I get no. in the sun. Look. I'm, I'm not even. I'm. I'm like very light skinned right? I like, can black it up as. <laughs> I mean, I, I have some melanin, but. <laughs> I can get a lot of melanin. It, 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 it'll have to do for 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 a lot of places. Anyways, right? he was saying. He said. He said. He, this is what he said to you. you. You're going in. You're like. Uh, do you feel safe? Oh, that's right. Yes. He asked me, "Do you feel safe?" Because he thought. Because he thought you were going to go into a clan meeting or something. <laughs> but you know what that says in my mind? I remember now when he said that. I remember thinking, okay, I didn't even think about it. I'm just going to a play gig. a gig. Yeah. Like, I'm going to meet new people. I don't know these people yet. But I'm kind of excited. We talked on the email, whatever. It's not even the this is not mind. in my mind. So when he says that, I'm thinking... So if you went into a black club, you'd feel threatened. <laughs> That's what I thought. Because if you think I feel threatened going to a situation where there's majority white people, yeah. you will feel threatened in a black club. Exactly. Yeah. So what's that saying about you? Yeah. You're the racist one. Like, not what the fuck? The- I'm out. Having- I'm, I'm excited to play a gig, and you're fucking bringing this with so me. So we went, we went, we went on a mini tour at the end of October in 2022. Yeah. And we went with this young fellow, <coughs> and this story came out while we were, you know, on the well, road. What and was the? I was like the, the 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 petty theft or the yeah the Mr. Petty Theft, and so I was like, are you? Fu-? I'm hearing this, and I'm in the back seat, and I'm laughing my ass off. 
And so now, anytime when you and I are together, we go anywhere, and I, I'm always like, and I have a certain way about me. Like, I'm, I, like, so like I'm not conf- like, confrontational. I'm not confrontational, <laughs> but I am snarky as fuck, and I'm fucking like really, really. You're like me, very snarky. I'm very snarky very and, and and sarcastic. So, and I'm not hiding anything. Like, he's talking about like, oh. I know I have white privilege. I'm like, I don't think you do. <laughs> I don't think, cause, cause, okay, yo, yo. He's rolling with me, and, and I'm as white as he get. Bro did not have white privilege. Not at all. He would be stopped anywhere you go. Everybody would question this motherfucker in a line, in a security but he's check. he's still stealing from the damn thing, and no one's questioning. I mean, so, he's like... Look this guy came, okay, this guy came on the road with us. He stole something, like a child, like a candy bar when we stopped for gas. And this is a thirty-year-old person. Like this 30 is not a, man. this is not a young young person. This is thirty-something. And he talked so much shit on the road, and he groped a waitress at one of the venues. This was this was the thing that, because all the other shit, I was just like fucking grow up. But when he did that, out. I was like, now you're fucking with my shit. Do you know that I feed my child and I try to put my family in, and put a roof over it with the work that I do? And you are messing with my livelihood. Not to mention the fact that I actually have two daughters and you went and messed with some, some man's daughter? If I were her father, I'd want, like, I would want the, his boss to do what I did. I don't want that guy sent home. I would want him like, that's it. You don't act like that. Anyways. Some accountability. Let's wrap this up. Is it that time? Yes, we did an hour. It's pretty good. Hey, we talked for an hour. There's so much more to talk We're about. We're drinking the wine. It's a nice. You know, we, we didn't even get to like the disposability and the accountability, like oh, the, so the accessibility let's, thing, let's, but... Let's... No, we're going to finish this off uh, on a nice subject where... We were talking about um, the rap beefs with the Kendrick and the Drake. <laughs> yes. So that comes in accountability as well. Like Drake, he's had a very great career. He's had a sex, a sex, sex, sex festival career. Sex festival. Successful, career. yeah, successful, sex successful. Sex. He's had. Um, but Can we say like accountability on that type of artistry now? So like, yeah, you see, <coughs> Puffy getting his and all this accountability, and now you know it's like uh, everybody scrutinized for what they say, what they do, what's in the past, and now there's a certain accountability for being that type of artist now. So they're now they're using that to like yeah. beat each other over with like you're a pedophile. No, you're a pedophile. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm like, but listen, I'm very suspicious about all these beefs because yeah. we were talking about this before the podcast. There's so much money involved. There's so much like when you understand the game is to keep eyes on screen as long as possible. That's what it is. It's all about. Keeping it starts to make these kind of things. So, okay, this will keep eyes on screens. People will be titillated. Ooh. So my my thing, <laughs> my thing what, what I was saying is was that you know the sales are are good, but the sales have skyrocketed with beef tracks. Like you know a lot of people don't buy albums anymore; they buy singles. So what really sells the singles is these beef tracks. So you have a whole lot of social media and culture and it's quick return culture right? that's built because around this beef. Mm-hmm. So and so, people will engage more in your diss tracks and listen to your diss tracks than your actual album because it has all this other stuff connected to it. It has all this. What's the bullshit. other stuff? Drama. Drama. So it's got drama. It just got drama. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a very very clever kind of marketing ploy, and it's easy. It's easy to manipulate the public and, and make it seem important. Oh, I have to follow this. They're beefing. What's going to happen? Yeah. I wonder if someone's going to get shot. Like, that's how depraved the public is. Like, you know, like it's, it's literally like, 
Hmm. This looks like it's gonna be some. There's gonna be some like some blood here or something. And even just the hint a little bit. There, there was a shooting over at Drake's Drake's place. Was it involved with this beef? Who knows. Well, you can take that But you can anywhere. best you bet can that can a lot of people will anywhere. speculate. You can take that anywhere. And you have a hundred yes. Everyone's going to speculate. outlets that are like speculating. Lining up like to speculate. Lining on this. And I think it's the new money maker, honestly. Because eyes on like, screen means money in pocket. So it's yeah. just keep, keep drolling out the shit that puts eyes on screen. But also like if somebody's... Here's the different thing with music and their understanding this with music. It's like a blockchain thing. So it's like... You own your song, and you know this. You put all the you know codes in and stuff like that. So okay. when people start using your content on their review channels, you're getting paid enormous amounts because they're using your content. But there, there's like ninety percent of what's out there is like. Uh, It's like I'm making a whole episode on reviewing these artists, but none of the shit is my original stuff. And none you're not giving proper credit to the artists. So exactly. That so, but that's YouTube's way of like giving compensation to the artists. So the smart ones, like Drake and Kendrick and all these guys that had this foundation built years ago, now when you beef with somebody, that is almost like. Uh, you know, Biggie and Tupac in the day, uh, getting well, paid off interviews and stuff like that. Exactly, but this is why people wonder: Is someone going to get shot? Is it going to be that dramatic? Because it went to that level. Yeah. And now that's the that's I don't the think threshold. So. I don't think there's that anymore because I don't think it's that. I think it's just the threat, just the idea. The idea of it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's all yeah. you need. Yeah. Like, you, they, they like, planted the idea. Come, come on. Now that it's there. Here's, here's <laughs> my thing. I know the area Drake's from, and I know people that know Drake. This kid is a rich kid, and he's from a rich area. This guy is never going to go roll up with his homies to Compton and co confront Listen to Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick. Kendrick like, Lamar it's is. Not gonna I don't happen. know Kendrick Lamar personally. I just know that from his lyrics, he must be an intelligent, thinking, critically Very thinking smart person. Individual. This is not. I I, I don't class either artist, of these two people. He's an idiots. artist, and here's the p thing. And I honestly, this is where like it's all coming to light. I think <coughs> Puffy, with other entities, made a lot of money off of a fabricated beef between Tupac and Biggie, which was overstimulated into something that was like nothing. And basically like a lot of entities made a lot of money off of the news, all other entities. Okay, so is Puffy truly evil? Uh, <laughs> yes and no. I think yeah. he is, yes. Yes and In a no. way where he has profited a lot of money off of other people's suffering. But and where he's at, been the, the other hand, and where he's been the cause of other people's suffering. I think suffering. he's been at the right place in the right time for these situations to happen. And people forget about the incident that happened well before he was with Biggie. <laughs> Uh, there was a party that he did at a big show where 10 people died because uh, st uh, the stands collapsed and he got away with that. And so, but if you even dig further back, there's a guy named Big One who was exactly like Notorious B.I.G. and he had a song like, him, like uh, uh, Juicy. And they stole that whole identity, that flow, and they made a career out of uh, Biggie Smalls, and they paid this guy off under the table. You can look at that all up, it's all truth. And I think what Puffy saw an opportunity to uh, make another industry out of beef, out of like gossip, 
hmm. in the hip hop community because in the '90s, hip hop was very conscious. It was very public enemy. It was very like uh, it was the new rock and roll. It made there, you yeah, think. Yeah, it was public enemy, but it was also um, um, Arrested Development. Yes. It was, so then it was that kind of then thing. Then you have yeah. the first very materialistic artist is Puff Daddy. So he hooks up with entities, you know, that want to push a certain narrative. And if he does what they want him to do, he can help just push this narrative and make a whole lot of money for himself. So I think he was in the right place at the right time. And he allowed... Puff is a sellout! He is. I told you I'd say some stupid shit. (laughs) (laughs) On that note, we should... (laughs) Yeah. Focus Podcast. We got Sule. Thank you very much. <coughs> it's time to make some pasta. Oh, yeah. We out. <laughs>